Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Course series, where today we're going to embark on a virtual treasure hunt and learn some of, some of the valuable lessons from some of the most world-famous treasure hunts with an adventure expert who has followed the trails of many treasure hunters throughout history, Travel Channel's Don Wildman. Now, before, before I pass things along to Don, I want to be sure everyone is prepared to make the absolute most out of today's live lesson, so a few things to keep in mind. You'll probably have some questions along the way, and Don will certainly have some questions for you as we treasure hunt our way through today's lesson. So feel free to use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen to both ask and answer questions throughout class. And if we don't get to those questions right away, not to worry, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end of the lesson specifically set aside for Q&A with Don. You'll also want to be sure that you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we're going to have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie with Don. And if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as Don Wildman, you'll be entered to win an autographed copy of a pretty relevant Gold Rush book that I won't spoil just yet, plus a one month subscription to the after school club of your choice. We'll talk a little bit more about that prize and how to enter toward the end of today's lesson. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and pass things along to your expert instructor, Don Wildman. Hello. Thank you, Haley. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? It's nice to see you back with Varsity Tutors. I'm so grateful to be invited back and teach another one of these, these fun courses. Tonight is great. This is a favorite subject of mine. I've done a lot of television on this subject, and it's just one of the chewiest, coolest subject matters you can get into because it kind of gets you all around the world and we're talking about treasure and we're talking about neat places and, and pieces of history that really matter and it's all a big puzzle we're going to put together tonight okay so the title of tonight's is uh tonight's course is exploring history's greatest treasure hunts and you can see on the screen there's it's broken down very logistically we're talking about it right now in the prologue uh, and then we're going to move through three sections, and each section involves sort of a different place and time of treasure hunting, okay? This is a, an amazing subject, as I say, because you can kind of dive into different times. When we're, we're talking about section one, we're kind of in that, that Spanish time, that kind of Car uh, pirates of the Caribbean time. We move to section two. That's more like the California gold rush time, the Pan Pacific you know, where, where gold was found in both California and elsewhere. And then we come back to, to North America in section three with the Aztec uh, empire down there in Mexico, where the Spanish came over and, and looked for gold there and all of that, which happened, which I took part in a great, uh, a great show of mine. So I learned a lot from the first course that I taught. Uh, we got a lot of content to go through. Um, so kind of this is how it works. We sort of start out slow and then we Middle of it, we kind of speed up and then we sprint to the end. <laughs> so that's kind of how it works. It's about a half an hour of all of this. So let's move on. So the first slide is really, um, obviously, a picture of the world, a map of the world. But it's also kind of a treasure map. Because the, the truth is, everywhere on this map that you're looking, and I'm seeing, you know, all seven continents there, um, everywhere in this world, there has been buried treasure found, treasure hunted for. The, 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 the trick of this, though, is to understand that treasure is a, is a flexible word. We're not just talking about, you know, hidden treasure like you saw in Pirates of the Caribbean stuffed in a cave or something like that. That's one kind of treasure. But there's other kinds of treasure that, that, uh, that fits the same category, the same definition. In fact, when you look for the definition of this in Webster's Dictionary, it basically says, Something of value, gold, jewels, money, silver, that is hidden or kept in a safe place. That's the very general term, a very general definition of what treasure really is, which can fit a lot of different things. But treasure can also be defined by that which humans seek out to improve their condition in life, right? They're a lot in life, so it's something out there to be found, mined, dug for, revealed, and once you find it, you are richer for it in various ways. So on that map, where would you look for buried treasure? I mean, pretty much everywhere. And it's a phenomenon that has created nations, fueled wars, created famine and uh, fame and ruin. And then it's one of those themes of human civilization that never ends and involves all of humanity. It's an all-encompassing story. But for day, today, treasure still means for you castles in Europe, gold rushes, sunken ships, and lots and lots of pirates, right? <laughs> pirates are great. It's 
turns out it's only part of the story, but it's a pretty good story. So when I look at that map, it takes us elsewhere. Let's go to the next slide there, Haley. And we're looking at a picture also of the United States. This is amazing, okay? So we're looking at the United States. And when you see these colors here, they're blue and they're gray. It might surprise you that gold has been found, treasure, gold has been found in all of those blue areas in the United States. And that's a really interesting and important thing to understand that when we talk about gold rush, and we're gonna talk a lot about that tonight, most people think of California, you know, the, the 49ers, right? The San Francisco 1849ers, that's the famous gold rush of the United States. But the truth is all around the United States at different times and in different eras, there have been gold rushes. I mean, in 1804, there was a gold rush in Virginia. In 18, you know, uh, 52 in Montana. In 1774, down there in, in uh, Arizona with the Spanish who, who were occupying that area. 1878, Pennsylvania. All right, all, all kinds of surprising things. Um, it, it, it's a, a surprising event all around, but we're talking tonight primarily about the Western hemisphere there. And if you look on that, that slide there, you'll see I don't know, four different uh, X's there. We got an X at the top, which is for at Alaska. We have one down in the, the California area there. Over here on, uh, under Florida, there is the Caribbean. Okay, that's the most famous one of all. And then of course, down in South America there, but all the way on the other side of the map, you see an X on Australia. These are the, the, the subjects that we're gonna talk about tonight. And that's what I mean about it being a completely worldwide idea, all right? So much of what we discuss tonight in terms of treasure is also gonna be gold, gold and silver. Okay, we're gonna focus on those because those are you know, really iconic stories that are really fun to understand. But understand we're also gonna talk about other kinds of treasure along the way. So the first thing I wanna say is that you need to think of gold in a different sort of way than you may think of it. It's not just you know, pretty jewels and all kinds of stuff. There's a reason it's so precious. And it's found most famously in what kind of place, right? Let's think about this. If you wanted to find gold at the bottom of the ocean, which ocean would you pick? All right, that's our first question for tonight. So think about it. Of all those things you've seen in the movies and on television, where is gold found most commonly in your experience? I'm not gonna give you away with the, with the clue up there, but it's one particular ocean there that gives you an idea. Anybody? I'm seeing Pacific, I'm seeing an Indian Ocean. Quite possibly there was gold found in all of these different places, maybe even up in the Arctic with Alaska, but the most famous, you know, most understood place for gold on the bottom of the ocean is the Atlantic Ocean, right? The Atlantic Ocean is where the Caribbean Sea is, which is part of the Atlantic there. And that's really where all the, the Spanish gold traveled from where they found it in Mexico area and down in South America, and they put it on ships and they sent them back across the ocean. And that's where so much, uh, so many ships sank to the bottom of the sea and therefore there's gold at the bottom of that ocean. But it's a worldwide phenomenon. Listen, gold is precious because it's rare. <laughs> it's very rare to find. They say that there has been only about you know, I, I forget that the, there's a very limited amount of gold that's ever been found on, on Earth because it's not of the Earth, which is really interesting. Let's take a moment to think of this. This is a scientific idea I, I just want you to go with that you understand this better than ever before. When the Earth was forming, and we're talking about 4.5 billion years ago, okay, this is when all the planets were forming in the, in the universe after the Big Bang, there was a time when, when stars would explode, these supernovas, and the metal that came from those stars came through the earth and, and came through the universe and landed in places like where the earth was being formed. And that metal sank into this mass that was suddenly forming into the earth. And that metal was silver, it was gold, it was all kinds of metals that actually entered into the earth's uh, material. And that actually is where gold comes from. It's a stardust. It's a stardust that comes to us from beyond, like a lot of things, but particularly the gold. And then over time, phenomenon, natural phenomenon carries it to the surface. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. But it's, it's that element of gold that is so interesting. 
that it's a precious, precious rare metal from beyond that kind of makes it more mysterious than, than it already is. Um, it's an era called the heavy bombardment. After the Earth was formed, there was another phenomenon later on that was called the bombardment of the asteroids, and they brought even more uh, gold in. And those asteroids exploded, and that's where you get more of the gold from the, that's on the surface of the Earth. So various phenomena we'll talk about in a little while um, brought that gold up to the surface, and, and here we are today. All right. There is a big rule in treasure hunting. A couple of them, and we're gonna go through this. The first rule of treasure, treasure follows technology. All right, all right. There's about three rules we're gonna go through tonight, so it's not a big long list, but this is how you, you kind of understand the, the framework of what we're talking about here. So you just heard me talk about uh, the age of this period of time in, in, in the Spanish time when they were you know, losing so many ships in there. This is called the age of discovery. All right, this is your first big history lesson here tonight. So the age of discovery overlaps with the age of sail. We're talking about the 1400s, the 1500s, that period of time, very generally speaking. And during this time, there were a lot of movements in the world that were going on here. Um, there was a new ability to sail further than ever before because of ship designs and sail designs and all kinds of shipping got better at, at moving through things. They went from being kind of stuck into the, in the seas of the Mediterranean where they were trading a lot and so forth to being more ocean going vessels. It was also the development of the compass, the magnetic compass, which enabled people to know where they were gonna go. And all this time, this new tech made ocean going voyages more possible. So let's put this in context. You have the fall of Rome, which is in the early, you know, back in the time of Christ and all that time, uh, the fall of Rome happens later on about the, the fourth, fifth centuries. And, and at that point, the dark ages begin, right? The, the famous time with all the castles and everything else in Europe. And the dark ages lead into what's the beginning of the Renaissance. In that time frame, right in there, is when a lot of stuff starts happening. A lot of trading begins. Trade comes in from, the, from Asia. And they start to understand that there's this whole world out there that people can now reach because of this new technology. And so kings and queens began commissioning expeditions. Very famously, Ferdinand II and his Queen Isabella of Spain met with a Genuine, a guy from down there in Italy, Christopher Columbus, came up and they met and said, yes, we're going to pay for this voyage that you want to go out and find the way to India. So in 1490s, 1492, Christopher Columbus lands in the Caribbean islands and calls them eventually the West Indies. He had planned on finding his way all the way to India. Of course, he didn't. He found his way to the, the Caribbean and to the islands of, of what are today the West Indies, Haiti, uh, the Bahamas, all those little islands down there off of Florida. Um, and it's that moment when the whole world changes and, they, and Europe realizes that the resources and, and minerals and quite possibly gold is available in this area. A guy named Cortez begins to learn about things. He moves over from, from, uh, from Spain and, and lives in Cuba and elsewhere. And he becomes one of the famous conquistadors who, is, uh, who, become, who begin to conquer these lands on behalf of Spain. That's what really causes the ability to find treasure. Treasure follows technology. When technology is advanced, people realize they can go places they couldn't go before. They can do things they couldn't do before and they're, they're better at repeating them. It becomes a system and routines and technology makes that available. Therefore, it makes treasure available. So rule number one of treasure hunting is technology follows, sorry, treasure follows technology, all right? Uh, okay, treasure was central to the age of exploration, which is the time that I'm talking about here. Um, there are certain as aspects to this conversation. I mean, exploration was really expensive. When I'm talking about those kings and queens deciding to send you know, ships and so forth with men on them all the way across the ocean, who knows what they're gonna find? These expeditions cost a fortune for these people. And it was a very bad investment for the most part because you're gonna spend a lot of money 
and get probably a little return. It was really talk about, you know, like flying blind here. These people had never even heard of the new world years before. And suddenly there's this whole place they're sending off these expensive ships. So you're going to have to make sure that you can pay for this, this exploration. Many uh, crews, by the way, were were uh, tempted, they got the incentive of being on these ships because they might get some share of the booty that they would find. You know, there, there would be a payoff on the other end. Um, it was expensive, it was dangerous. And it was absolutely, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 it stops me dead in my tracks to think about this because I have often done TV things and, and we talk about this stuff so road. And I really want you to understand this this whole idea of this class and, and these classes is to give you a chance to pause and to think of how unusual these circumstances were. I find history really interesting that way, you know, it, especially when you're in school, it, it kind of reads literally like a book. I mean, you're, you're assigned pages and chapters to learn and you have to learn dates and you have to, you know, be tested on them. And all of that is, is very necessary to understanding the whole thing intellectually, but you have to let the emotion of the time get in there as well. So feel what it might've been like to, to get on one of those ships, to be one of those uh, Colum Christopher Columbus crews or any other ones and going all the way across. I mean, it took months to get across the ocean. And when, when they got there, they didn't know what they were gonna find. And all that period of time is an incredibly exciting and incredibly daring time for humanity as we sort of launched off into the great unknown. <clears throat> this also, it, often we say that uh, treasure is the second rule of treasure hunting is that it moves people. Um, I think we skipped a slide there because there's a, the chance to talk about Spain is very important here to all of this. Um, I have mentioned Spain several times. At different time periods throughout history, different nations, kingdoms are more powerful than others. We live in the time when the United States of America is the most powerful nation in the world. We have been all of our lives, we're quite used to it. But the truth is a hundred years before, 200 years before, there was the English and there was the French and there was the Spanish. Around about the 14, 1500s, Spain really ran the show. They had a lot of money and they had a lot of power. Where did they get that money and power? A lot of it came from the idea of, of colonizing the new world, okay? This was a new thought had come to pass that we needed, they, these countries needed money. They needed to be fighting wars and, and uh, funding expeditions and all of these sorts of needs for money created this need for colonization. Okay, they had to go somewhere and find these, these resources that they needed in order to trade back home, in order to pay off debts. And gold became a major resource and a major way for Spain, certainly, to take care of those problems. A lot of riches. And it, it made Spain for a few years, for a, a few centuries there, the richest nation on earth, which is why people in Mexico and all the way through South America, they all speak Spanish, right? These colonies that they built, that they created from Mexico on down into South America were all Spanish colonies. They taught them Spain, Spanish. Interestingly, though, when you look at the South American map, there's Brazil in the middle of that, the biggest of them all right there. Brazil is a Portuguese colony, which is really interesting. And they speak some form of Portuguese in, in Brazil. So much gold and silver had to be shipped to Spain that the Spanish actually created treasure fleets, right? There, were, there was a system for moving all of this gold that they found. And when we're talking about all this gold, there were estimations of 180 tons of gold that the Spanish found in South America and in um, Mexico area. It was really amazing. 180 tons, that's a lot. Um, also 1,600 tons of silver. Now try to wrap yourself around that. In today's money, the amount of gold that the Spanish pulled out of, of uh, Mexico and, and South America was $4 billion worth in today's money, $4 billion, seven billion of silver. A lot of gold left the Americas and went back to Spain. And they did this by using treasure fleets, they call it, enormous flotillas of ships that they would get together and they would sail across 
not only holding gold and, and silver, but also other kinds of resources and so forth, but they would sail back in safety, you know, greater number, safety in numbers. <laughs> and as they went, uh, some of them suffered through the storms and got blown off course and pri pirates would attack and all sorts of things. But because of those numbers, they could get so many more ships back to Spain and preserve the, uh, the gold that they had found. A remarkably large proportion of the, of the gold and silver they discovered or they took and discovered in, in the Americas made it back to Spain. And that's why they were so powerful and so important in that time frame. There's a very famous uh, story about the treasure fleet of 1715, which I like a lot. The treasure fleet of 1715 uh, was blown off course and landed in a hurricane uh, right off the, the coast of Florida. And sometime in the 60s, the 1960s, they began to find these things. I mean, doubloons were, were washing up on shore and so forth. And so people started to, to explore those waters and found a lot of those ships and a lot of that buried treasure. But Spain was really the, the driving force of so much of this um, because they needed the gold so badly and they found a way of doing it. They conquered these lands, as we'll learn later on. Uh, they took over the Aztec Empire along with Pizarro. Uh, that was Cortez. Pizarro went down to South America and he took on the Inca Empire. And, and those two empires controlled a lot of lands and a lot of resources and a lot of gold. And much of that was taken away from them and sent back to Spain. The second rule of treasure hunts is that it's an ideal way to move people. Okay, so this is an interesting idea. This is a pretty, uh, a cause and effect, if you will. When you have a, a big treasure that has been announced, let's say the California gold rush or any number of gold rushes around the world, what is gonna happen is a lot of people are gonna go try to find that, that fortune. They're gonna go exploring those lands to try to do that. They're trying to try to find gold. But what happens as a result is that that population has moved to that zone and they stay put. And so therefore the, the second rule exists, which is treasure is an ideal way to move people. Once there's treasure out there, people are gonna go to try to find it and then they're gonna plant themselves and they're gonna create a community there. That's kind of what we're talking about when we say about colonies because colonies were the way that they organized this, this effort, these great nations of Europe primarily. Uh, sent their expeditions down to any place that they really found they could they could uh, make a lot of money, basically, you know, try to find resources they could trade with and, and metals that, that they could pay off debts and so forth. They would uh, create colonies in those places. This is a, a for better or worse aspect of history, because a lot of stories of colonization are about suppressing native populations, which you've heard of a lot. Um, uh, while it was necessary to organize these expeditions and have a, a base of operations, it was also unfortunately necessary to suppress these, these native populations. And in many cases, because of diseases that they hadn't encountered before, these populations were decimated. I mean, enormous loss of life because of, of uh, European diseases being spread around the world and people not having the, the, the ability to fight them. We're certainly aware of that these days in terms of the disease and the pandemic. Imagine that same situation kind of existed ev everywhere in the world when uh, European populations arrived with their, what there were normal diseases for them, but suddenly spread among people that had no defenses in their bodies to fight these things. So enormous amount of, of, uh, of death that happened as a result. But in the end, a new kind of nation exists. A population has moved to this land where the treasure was found and those populations mix and one is destroyed and the history of that land has changed forever. And that's what treasure has done for humankind, okay? Treasure has its, it, it made a, both painful and glorious things happen on earth, uh, often brutal, but undeniably a large reason that most of us are where we are today, are who we are today. In most ways, we are Americans, for example, because America had treasure that people wanted very badly back in Europe. Without that situation, we probably wouldn't be here today. It was treasure that brought our ancestors to this land. And then good and bad things happened, but that's the truth of it, and that's what happens. All right. So here's a little fun thing. I told you, now we're in the middle and we're gonna really start speeding up. So think about this. What's a brand name 
perhaps a sports team or an ice cream. Hmm? <laughs> kind of giving it away here, and I. That comes directly from a famous treasure hunt. Think about it. Sports teams that come from treasure hunts. I'm really thinking, oh, so are you. Okay, San Francisco, exactly. What's that name of that town, uh, that team? The San Francisco 49ers, right? Of course, 19, 1849 was the California gold rush. Uh, we also have other names for other things that come, the Klondike bar, exactly, very good. Klondike bars, um, that delicious ice cream with the chocolate covering. Mm. Um, actually is referring to a gold rush that happened in the 1850s, I believe, no, later on, actually, than that. Um, later in the 1800s, uh, when they discovered gold up in the Canada, the Yukon area of, of Alaska, Canada, that zone. And so the Yukon, the Klondike Bar was, is a reference to that. Um, also, there's other brands, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but, but Levi's is a brand that comes from the, uh, from the gold rush times. Um, kind of an uh, interesting reason for that because there are other sort of ancillary activities that are going on around these things. But, uh, and, and so brands come out of that. But there are aspects of these treasure hunts that live with us today in the most mundane way through the brand names that, we've, that, that we use and, and we hear. Go 49ers. I'm a big fan. I don't know about you. I just like their uniforms. They look good. All right, the next slide here. Okay, so the golden state of California. We could spend the entire show on California. Uh, personally, I love the place. I lived there for a good part of my life. Uh, and what did I do there? I sought treasure. <laughs> I sought treasure in my field of work because I was trying to find television work out there. And that was a form of treasure that I went to California to try to find. And lo, lo and behold, I found it. I got some, some level of, of treasure. I hit the gold, the seam of gold. And here I am talking to you as a result today. Um, the name California, interestingly, comes from a work of fiction. Uh, understand that California and Arizona and New Mexico and Mexico and Texaco, Texas, those areas, that whole southwest corner of the United States was once part of Mexico, part of Spain. Uh, Mexico had its war of independence from Spain in 1821. From that point on, those lands were Mexico. We had a big war with Mexico in the 1840s, 1846 to 1848, and we won. We attacked uh, Mexico. We went all the way down to Mexico City. We took over the place. And the Mexican War resulted in a one of the great advances in geography as far as you know land mass as far as the united states goes there was something called manifest destiny in those days and throughout the 19th century people believed that the united states needed to be uh, ocean to ocean atlantic to the pacific and that part of the world that california southwest needed to be brought into the fold or that manifest destiny could not manifest so people were very happy to get california just for that reason alone, but also they knew that there was a lot of treasure out there. So they were very glad for that. The name California, interestingly, comes from a work of fiction back in Spain at the time. You know, think about it. It's like something like Harry Potter or some sort of famous uh, piece of literature that we all talk about and we all know about. This was one of those kinds of things. It was a big poem and it featured a queen who lived on a, an island. And her, it was Queen Khalifa. And so when the Spanish came up and discovered this area, they thought that California was an island. They thought it was kind of divided off by water on both sides. They were wrong about that, but that was their suspicion. So as a result, they named it after Queen Khalifa, which was a very famous story in those days. And she lived on California. And so it became California based on that, that myth. Um, it eventually became California when the Americans sort of anglicized it. And that's, and that's how it became part of our lives. Can anybody tell me what the state motto of California is? Can you, how about you Californians out there? Anybody, uh, Eureka, exactly. Eureka, which is also a city at the top of California, comes from what? The gold rush. When people found gold in California, they mythically said, Eureka, I found it. And that's where it comes from. Uh, they found gold in the Sierra Nevada mountains, sort of north central of California. 
And in what year did that happen? Anybody? I've said it several times. 1849, exactly. 1849, the, Cal the California gold rush is the 49ers. The San Francisco 49ers comes from that. That was the site. And this was the site of the biggest treasure hunt in American history as far as gold is concerned. And much of California's history post-Spanish is shaped by gold. It's an amazingly big part of life. I mean, California gold left a huge giant imprint, not only on California, but on this country and really the world. This is where the, Cal the, the sort of fabled aspect of California really begins. Because in 1849, there were a few men up in Sutter's Mill, it was called, uh, who noticed that there were gold nuggets on the ground. Now, as I've explained, this is not the first time people were looking for gold. I mean, for decades before this, gold had been found back east. It had been found down south. There's an Alabama gold rush. There's a Tennessee gold rush. All throughout American history, earlier than 1849, gold was being found all over the United States. So it, it, it didn't come as a big surprise, but it was certainly a welcome surprise that they could find gold in California. We're going to explain why that happens in California and in other places as well, but in a few moments. Um, they found loads of gold. I mean, just gigantic amounts of gold. Uh, they say that 370 tons of gold were found in California in five years. 370. Now comp compare that to what the Spanish took out of, of Mexico and South America over the entire period, which is 180 tons. Here it's 370 tons. Is that double? It's almost double, yeah, uh, of gold in a very short amount of time. In today's dollars, $16 billion of gold were found in in, uh, in California. So in those days, in 1849, 1850, 51, those are the, the years of the California gold rush. California is pretty remote. It's out there in the middle of, uh, you know, up there on the other end of the continent, right? And there's no way to get that gold back. So it has to be kept somewhere. I did a little television bit about this. It was really fascinating. I went to the San Francisco Mint, which still exists, the old mint in the middle of San Francisco. Anybody been there? Anybody seen that, that mint building? It's a beautiful old building in the middle of downtown San Francisco. So in the bottom of that building, um, well, first of all, let me tell you, that building was, was put there in order to receive the gold, the dust, the nuggets, any kind of gold that had been found up in the, up in the mountains and brought in and the government would take the gold, pay the, the, the prospector for the gold, and then mint gold coins out of, those, out of that gold that it brought to them. And there was literally a mint inside that, uh, inside that building. Hence the name, San Francisco Mint. And they created gold coins and silver coins, and then they put them in bags. And these enormous sacks of gold and, and silver went down to the vaults in the bottom of the building. There are some seven, eight, maybe nine vaults in this building. I think you can walk down and look at them. Uh, we filmed in there, and, and the man who was showing me around, who I was interviewing, pointed something out amazing to me. And if we can go back to that slide, I can refer to this. Um, that uh, image that we were looking at on the side of that, there you go, it's on the left my left anyway, um, is kind of vague. And what that really is, is impressions of the gold coins that are being pushed into the walls. So think about that. You had so much gold in each one of those vaults that the pressure of the gold sacks on top of each other as they piled them up in the room were pushing outward into the walls of, the, of each vault. And that shows you better than anything else how much gold we're talking about. So much in there that it was actually pressing its impressions of the gold coins into the walls. It's a pretty good illustration, isn't it? The other aspect of this that was really important was they had so much riches, so many, you know, so much gold in San Francisco before they could get it back east. So this is the American West in those days, 1848, 1850. There's not a lot going on out west. Primarily, these are Native American tribes and you know, a little bit of settlements here and there, but um, not a huge amount of development for, you know, uh, Anglo-Americans out in the West. So they needed to get this gold back East. There was a big fear down the road a little bit, about a decade later when the Civil War started, that the Confederates were gonna sail around and try to get that gold from, from San Francisco. So it became a big imperative to create the means to get that gold back East. And one of those imperatives led to the Transcontinental Railroad. That had a lot to do with trying to get those rail, that railroad across the entire United States. And people don't really realize that. 
there was a lot of other reasons too. It was a big economic boom that could come from, from railroads, but a, a, a big urgency was to bring the gold from California back east and make it safe and use it. When you're talking about, what was that amount again? $16 billion back in those days, the United States was gonna use that and become a very powerful nation as a result. It reminds me, you know, when we're talking about putting a railroad across, I mean, they would have known about the Spanish fleets. You know, this is hundreds of years later. I mean, they would have known those, those stories of, of those ships going down in the Caribbean and all those pirates uh, attacking them and all the rest of it. And that those legends would have come down the ages. So it was really important to the Americans to get that, sh that, that to find a way to get those uh, those loads of gold back from the West Coast and back East. And that was the railroad primarily. Otherwise they had to sail the whole way around South America back again. There was no Panama Canal in those days. There was no efficient means of using a ship to go there. You didn't want to put it on a ship because they could sink. What you want is a trustworthy train that could bring it right back East. And that's what they eventually came about. So there you go. So, so much of what created California came directly from technology. What was that rule again? Rule one, treasure follows technology. <laughs> I can't remember if it goes the other way. Uh, it's the treasure and technology always working together. And there you have the railroad coming from the treasure and vice versa. It's an interesting thing because after a period of time, gold rushes became more and more understood, you know, as a, as a means of building things and, and creating uh, wealth in certain places. After a while, people start learning the game. So there was on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, another gold rush going on in Australia. Same story as the United States. There had been many gold rushes throughout South, uh, Australia in those days, earlier on, you know, up north and then down south. And, and it's the same kind of map that I, that I showed you of the United States. You can find different gold rushes all over Australia. So much so that they understood what was going on. And many Australians had moved to the United States. I mean, the California gold rush was a big phenomenon around the world. It was global. And people came from everywhere, from China, from Europe, to, to try to get rich off of California gold. Many of those people came from Australia. These guys were good at finding, you know, prospecting for gold. They had a lot of experience. So in order to draw all that population back, the Australians advertised pretty much you know, literally advertised, we have gold here in Australia. In about 1851, there is the Australian gold rush, in quotes. Understand, there were other ones before this, but this is the big one. Just like the, the 18, you know, 49 gold rush in California, the Australian gold rush happens. So it's no coincidence. One followed right after the other, because the Australians kind of got it. They understand, oh, this, what just happened in California, they basically started to build California out of that gold rush. You know, the money that, that, that they took out of those hills in California kind of establishes San Francisco as the major city that's there because there's a lot of money there. And so that a lot of the, that money creates the, the buildings and so forth that happens. That whole thing had gotten very well known around the world. So, so other people that had gold were kind of going, mm, maybe we should use this for ourselves. And the Australians very much consciously did this. And they create the California, the Australia gold rush and start asking those Californians to come over and, and work there. What does that do? That moves people. Remember, that's the second rule. That's the movement of people that comes from treasure. So technology and, and people movement, both of those rules in play here in, in Australia. Get a lot, of, a lot of gold in Australia. This is a, a piece from television that I did back in the 08 area, I think it was. I look quite a bit younger. Um, I'm climbing through uh, a gold mine that's still in existence and still finding gold um, just west of, uh, of Sydney is the area. It's called the Blue Mountains, and it's a place called uh, Orange Area and so forth. And you see, it looks like a standard gold mine, right? That's right out of the cartoons. Well, these are old, old mines that are sort of re-mined uh, over time in order to find the gold that was not there, um, that they hadn't, hadn't pulled out. Um, it, it, it really is interesting to me because it, it builds uh, Australia. There's a, a graphic here you're looking at that I want to talk about. So that's the mineral, that's the lava of a, a volcano coming up through the earth and it's carrying up through it, the fissure, um, the gold that was down below. All right. So 
think about that for a moment. I mentioned that gold comes from the stars, right? The metals all come from those supernovas that happened before the earth was formed or as the earth was forming. That means that the gold is down underneath the surface. The asteroids come, break up, and that gold is buried. So what does it take to bring gold up to the surface? Magma, volcanic activity. So you often find gold, you'll always find gold, where there has been volcanic activity. So all around the Pacific Rim, you know, we're talking about Australia, California, Japan, all these different places have volcanoes. And that magma that comes up brings the gold to the surface. That's a good way to try to go out and try to find gold. When you start looking at places, you can see the topography and where there is an old volcano, you can pretty much guess that there's going to be some gold or silver somewhere nearby. Australia was made by gold, just like uh, California was made by gold. And then there's the Klondike. This is kind of my favorite one of all. You know, I, I, it's more modern. It com, comes around in sort of my century anyway, which is 1900 era. era. Um, and it happens up in the Alaskan Yukon zone. You see the Klondike bark there? We talked about that uh, earlier, the, a brand that reminds you of this whole period. This was a, 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 a Herculean is the word, you know, an epic journey to get up to this area in order to find gold. It comes later on. Um, understand Alaska wasn't a state in those days. Alaska was a territory. We made it an official territory, not until 1912. So at, back in this time, it's just sort of a wild wilderness up there, more defined by the Canadians than the Americans, because it was really so hard to get up there. So this whole discovery of gold happens around the Yukon River, the Klondike River, and then the Klondike region is what it's called. So people start moving up there, just like they did coming out to California, just like they did going down to Australia, just like they did in the original coming over from, from Europe to find the gold in, in Central America. All these treasure hunts happen in the same sort of way and the same results happen as well. People go there, they sort of settle there, they find the riches, they exploit the, the resource, they send it back, they make money off of it. And then many of those people have stayed put. And, and businesses begin and homes are built and, and people have moved there. The other rule that we were talking about. A billion dollars came out of, out of the Klondike. A lot of money between 1896 and 1899 kind of made the name of the place. So we have a fame. Uh, this is my favorite book. Maybe you can tell me you've heard about it, right? The Call of the Wild, Jack London. Jack London, great writer. Call of the Wild is about a, book, uh, about a, a dog named Buck. And that dog was a sled dog. And, and this great book is narrated by the dog character. This is one of my precious books. This is a first edition of Call of the Wild. Isn't that beautiful? Old book. And I keep picking it up and reading it just like I was a kid. Um, really a, an amazing story and stories come out of this stuff. And it, and it becomes the whole understanding for Americans that there was indeed this place called Alaska. It was probably the first place that anybody ever really understood the first time that anybody ever understood that that was going on. I mean, the same thing happens uh, to, to the Northwest that happened to California and happened to colonies down in, in Central and South America as well. When Spanish sort of planted themselves there, so people begin planting themselves up in this area. And Seattle really is, is there, is the prosperous city that it, it soon became because of gold, you know, because gold was brought back from from the Klondike, from Alaska and all those areas and brought down to the nearest city that you would get off a boat and go and cash in your, your gold. And that was Seattle. So a lot of that, the wealth that created, that came from the, uh, from the gold rush created Seattle, just as it, as it had previous done, done, previously done in San Francisco. It's pretty interesting how they're all very similar. The same thing happened to Melbourne, as a matter of fact, Melbourne, Australia. It's uh, one of those beautiful cities in Australia that has all these glorious buildings and so forth. Much of that came from the wealth that came out of Australia during its gold rush. The third rule of treasure hunts is that the greatest treasures go to the people who supply the hunters. I, re I, re I um, referred to this earlier on about ancillary, building, uh, uh, ancillary businesses. So it's a pretty big uh, gamble to go out into the wilderness and hope you find gold. Some people know how to do it better than others, but really it's luck of the draw in many cases, and who knows, more failure than success by far. 
and, and many people injured and killed. It's a really dangerous business as we've demonstrated here. The people who really profited, who really long-term made, uh, made the gold rush work for them anywhere in the world were the businesses that supplied the treasure hunters. So what are these pictures that you see here? Levi Strauss. He created these, you know, Levi Strauss is a business that created these denims that were, you know, incredibly strong and, and they could wear these, this, this incredibly strong canvassy material that would stand up to all the, you know, the, the conditions that they were living through. Up there, you see Wells Fargo, the bank, okay? There's Wells Fargo had to get that, uh, that gold back and all that communication that happened across the country happens because of the stage coaches that originally start doing it, you know, before the trains. The stage coach is the Wells Fargo wagon that you see in their brand name. That comes from the gold rush, from the California gold rush. I mean, that's why the Golden State is called the Golden State, because these gold, these, these businesses and all the industries that came out of this all came from gold. Same with Seattle. That's the other city that you see there. Lots of businesses there that happened uh, because of that. I recommend the underground uh, the underground tour in Seattle. It's an amazing example of, of how the, even the structure of Seattle, the downtown was sort of engineered as a result of gold because they needed places to keep it. And those bank vaults were under, under the sidewalk. It's a long story. I'll get into it another time. So is there any gold at all still to be discovered in America? I mean, it's all fine and dandy to talk about these historic, these historic moments that were hundreds of years ago. And that's, they're fascinating and amazing. And hey, you might find some sunken treasure, you know, if you look down there in the, in the Caribbean, but there are legends. Uh, there is one in particular of gold that may very well still exist, hidden, waiting to be found right here in the mainland United States. And this is an amazing story called the, the legend of the Aztec gold. So, before we get into this, I need to tell you who the Aztecs were. Uh, again, you've heard this. There's the, the Aztecs are, you know, you've heard the name. It's sports teams are named Aztecs and so forth. The Aztecs were a, a, a Native American tribe that moved down, migrated down from, from what is today the United States and then down into Mexico. They had, a, they had a prophecy that told them to go there. And they found an area down there which was uh, fit the prophecy that suited what they needed you know, in terms of their criteria. And they went and they moved to this area, which is now called Mexico City. In those days, it was called, they named it Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan, yeah, Tenochtitlan. And the Tenochtitlan was a, an amalgam of several different areas. There was a drained lake, and then they created this amazing empire city in the middle of what is, you know, what is now Mexico City. And there's a lot of archaeology in downtown Mexico City that shows where this place was. The Aztecs were a migratory band that settled down. They found their treasure, which was a new homeland, right down there in the middle of, of the Mexico area, as you can see right there. Um, and they set up, and over a you know, period of 100 or so years, they, they created this whole society that was incredibly prosperous. They had an incredibly brilliant plan for building this place. Uh, and they mixed with the other tribes that were there as well. They took over some and they created this enormous empire that was very exciting to the Spanish. This is where the early, when Columbus came to the Caribbean, the early Spanish conquistadors, these conquerors, started to hear these legends. That's where I, met, I mentioned Hernan Cortez. Cortez was living in Cuba and all around uh, in the Caribbean. He heard about these people. He heard about this place where gold was you know, everywhere and El Dorado and all these kinds of places that they'd heard about. And this is why he came to find that gold. Well, uh, in the process of this, of course, the, the Aztecs knew that they were around and there were various conflicts and so forth. And, and when the final moment came, when Cortez and his men came to, to battle the final time, Montezuma, who was the king of the, uh, of the Aztecs, by legend, according to legend, dispatches a group of some 6,000 Aztec people, you know, his people, and sent them north to what they assumed was the homeland, what they knew to be the homeland of their original migration. So they're going back home, and he tells them to take the gold with him, take a whole bunch of gold. And they travel back up through what is now Mexico, find their way back to the southwest of the United States, and begin to move back towards their homeland. Look on the, on the screen there, you see me walking down, and I'm actually in a museum there, 
that was built over the palace, originally Montezuma's palace. And that's a bunker room where Montezuma had a vision of what he should do. And he sat in this bunker room and, and decided how he would handle this. And that's, as legend goes, that's where he decided to send these people back home and to take gold with them. So this begins the, the legend of the Aztec gold. People knew that it was out there and they went to find it. So this is probably one of the most famous gold uh, treasure hunts in American history. Um, it's still, many people still think it's out there somewhere um, in the American Southwest. And the big question is where? This is a, a very famous place that I've been to, um, the Lost Dutchman Mine, written by a friend of mine, Ron Feldman. Um, the Lost Dutchman Mine is probably the most famous American uh, treasure hunting mystery of all. It's in Arizona, in the Superstition Mountains outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, people know that up there, there is a, a place where a guy named, um, oh, what was his name? Uh, a Germanic name, I can't remember it now. Uh, a guy started showing up with a lot of gold. He built, he dug a, a mine out there in the Superstitions and he started showing up with a lot of gold out of nowhere, they thought. And this guy was, um, was going to, he was a, a German actually, but they called him the Dutchman. And so when he died, the legend of this, this, uh, this mine also died with him. And so people have been trying to find the lost Dutchman's mine for 150 years. Uh, according to the legend, they haven't found it. But when they do, apparently they would find that Aztec gold. Make sense? So that's only one possibility. There's many possibilities, and I want you to join in on this. So Let's follow some clues as to where the Aztec gold may have gone. All right, let's look at that map. And there are many different clues to follow. This is fun. This is a, a little treasure hunt for you. So let's follow the clues. Um, the Aztecs didn't have to reach a great lake, but they did have to cross a Grand Canyon. What does that mean to you? Understand we're trying to figure out where this path was, where this trail that they, that they traveled and then may have left their gold hidden a long way uh, along it. So there's the clue to get to this location, Aztecs didn't have to reach a great lake, but they did have to cross a Grand Canyon. Where's the Grand Canyon? The American Grand Canyon is in, right? No, not in Oklahoma. Uh, it is not in New Mexico. It's in Arizona, right? It's in the area of Arizona, um, north of Tempe and all that sort of thing. It's up there in, the, in that beautiful thing. Anybody who has not seen the Grand Canyon in your life, oh my goodness, it is a big must. It is one of the greatest things to see in creation. And I'm not kidding. It really blew my mind the first, second, and third time I saw it. So they didn't have to cross the Great Lake, but they did have to cross the Grand Canyon. So let's say they went through that area. Let's go to the next clue. Second clue, unlike the Aztecs, this location doesn't go from A to Z, but you may already know that. Okay, so let's look closely in on this map. Um, so the clue is telling us this location doesn't go from A to Z. What's A to Z out there? Arizona, right? Yeah, Arizona, exactly, there you go. Uh, but you may already know that. So what does you refer to? Anybody? Uh, Utah, there you go, exactly, Utah. So Utah is right above uh, Arizona somewhat. And so that's where they were heading, the Aztecs, up through Utah. You know, that's interesting. You have to understand the word Utah comes from the Ute, uh, U-T-E. The Ute is the tribe that, uh, uh, the Native American tribe that were there, the Utes. And that's why they call Utah, U Utah, Utah, because of the Utes. And so the Utes have a lot in their language that sounds like Aztec language. It's a linguistic similarity between them. And that's why they think that possibly the, Ute, uh, the Aztecs found their way back to this area. Uh, if you reverse course, you almost make bank. So let's turn bank around and uh, look at that word. And it's kind of a vague clue there, I admit, but it's, uh, it's saying, what do you see at the bottom there? In Utah is Kanab. So Kanab is, is kind of one of those places that people suspected might be where the Aztec um, tribe left their gold. That was one of those places. You know, there was, there was a lot of speculation um, and a lot of prospectors came out there just like they did in, 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 the, uh, in California and Klondike and all that sort of thing. They came to find the treasure. 
the Aztec treasure. It's a little more subtle a story, you know, it's more of a legend story, but, uh, but it was the same goal <laughs> to get rich, to find gold and get rich. Uh, and Kanab was the place where one of those guys, I think his name was Freddie Crystal, actually thought he could find it there. And he, he kind of got the entire town on his side. I did a show about that as well. And, and that was uh, uh, a whole town got involved in finding this, um, this cave that he had suspected was there. There's Kanab. Anybody been there? It's, a, it's not too far from Grand Canyon. It's one of those stopping places if you're touring that area. It's a really famous zone. You know, what was really funny about it is it's one of the big Hollywood Western areas. So if you go to Kanab, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of little signs that tell you how many Westerns were made out there, which I found to be totally charming. Then we went up, they said, oh, look at that. So cool. What an incredible day of work. We went into this place with, uh, with LIDAR technology, you know, with a ground penetrating radar. That's what my partners are carrying in. And we're looking for a possible hole where the, the Aztecs may have used and, uh, and hidden the gold. They were all sorts, they were very clever people, of course, and they um, created traps. They created, they would bury the gold and then they would create traps that would trap anybody who tried to get it. And in one case, they would do it. They dig a hole with a with water above, it was called a water trap. And so if you go out in there and pull something out, it, it would trigger the, the booby trap and the water would pour down and, and drown you. <laughs> There were other kinds of things as well. Very much the Indiana Jones world we're in here, you know, where, where past cultures have, have gone to great lengths to protect what was theirs and, and, and would kill anyone who came near it. It's an amazing cave there, as you see. So it's a very cool uh, environment that just keeps on going back and back and back. So my favorite part of my job is to explore these spaces and to imagine what past cultures were doing inside them. There's a lot of carvings on the walls. There's a lot of uh, dead end tunnels and so forth. But this was supposed to be where the Aztec gold was. And I was not going to find it uh, because it was probably hidden deeper than that if it was there. But I was interested in, in how these caves looked on the inside. They're all dug out by erosion, of course. There's beautiful caves that are just, you know, millennia of, of rainfall have created them with the flow. But then there's also some more intentional uh, holes, which we found one and we went down with the LIDAR and decided it was either, we couldn't tell if it was natural or artificial, but it was incredibly mysterious. So the trail leads up to there. Where it leads to uh, was the answer. Um, no one ever found the gold. No one's ever found the lost Dutchman mine. Uh, and it's the final rule of treasure hunts. There is treasure out there. It's up to you to find it. It's up to you whether it, you follow the legends, you jump on new technology, and you find your own treasure in selling to the hunters. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure exactly. So this is a, a sort of interesting ending to the story. I just want to tell you that the real uh, gold, the real treasure of this story was the answer uh, to where their homeland really was. That's what we were looking for. And, and the word is Atslan. Sorry, I'm shaking things. Uh, the word is Atslan, and that is their famous mythical homeland, which we found to be in Utah, indeed, uh, probably near this Great Salt Lake, which is a very similar environment to where Tenochtitlan was, uh, Tenochtitlan down in Mexico, similar kind of situation. And they probably found their way back to where they began. And that's my story. I... Uh, I told you it was a really long <laughs> tale and it involved a lot. So think about what we just talked about. We talked about uh, how early Europeans came to North America after Christopher Columbus in order to find what? Treasure. The treasure they were looking for was gold and silver. Uh, they found it in great sums. So those gold and silver, those galleons, those, those ships filled with gold and silver all went back for a hundred years or so, many years back to Spain and funded great European kingdoms and made that time in Europe entirely possible. When you go over there, you see all those cathedrals and all those great buildings that comes from, that was funded by the gold that was found, you know, by conquering the Aztecs and conquering the Inca. Uh, you can, discuss the morality of that, discuss, you know, whether that was fair, ethically fair or not. Uh, there are certainly in, in a strong argument to be made that the Europeans should have stayed home and let those people alone. But the fact of history is it happened. 
colonization happened everywhere in the world. And we have the culture we have as a result. And they got the gold. Then you have all these other movements as well. Technology leads, we find our way into California, to Australia, to Alaska. It's a fascinating movement is what I'm talking about. As, as man goes looking for, for a treasure, goes hunting for treasure, he finds an entirely different phenomenon happening. Entire, and the world is built around him as he creates these environments to find this treasure. So I hope you understand the, 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 the power of this story, that treasure hunting isn't just something in the movies. It really, really happened all over the world. And as it happened, it changed the world. It created civilization. It fueled innovation. It created technology. We're still in these treasure hunts. If you think about it, what am I talking to you on now? I'm talking to you on, on, on a computer, right? I'm looking into a camera that can beam me all over the world. That's a, an incredible technology that created Silicon Valley, right? Think about California, still the golden state because still gold is being found. It's just in a different kind of form. So technology is often that kind of treasure that people are looking for these days because from technology, you can make a lot of money. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you understand that uh, there's a lot of go things going on and uh, it's still going on if you just keep at it. Thank Thanks. you so much, John. And uh, that was certainly quite the adventure. And before we end <laughs> our adventure and, uh, and, and let folks who perhaps have dinner to get to or maybe a little bit of homework, uh, we've got a couple of really wonderful questions and we wanna make sure students have that selfie opportunity as well. So as you may have guessed, uh, alongside that one month subscription to the after school camp of your choice, you will also have the opportunity to win a signed copy of Call of the Wild, our treasure oh. tale, if you post these selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors as well as Don Wildman. So I will put Don front and center once again so we can pose for that selfie. Let's go. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Don. And if you haven't had a chance to get that selfie just yet, well, he'll he'll be hanging for just a couple more moments while we answer some of those questions. And you're welcome to snap a photo then. Uh, so we had a couple of really wonderful questions, actually many. We'll try Shoot. to get to just a few. Uh, we had uh, several books noted and mentioned somewhere along the way, whether they dealt with treasure specifically or just generally dealt with exploration. So our uh, our bookworms of the group were wondering if you had any other book recommendations about exploration and adventure. Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would just Google this up. I would Google Spanish galleons or Spanish doubloons. Um, you're going to find a ton of stuff under that. Uh, all kinds of books. I mean, there's so many books that I I can't even think of one right now. There's just ample amounts that you can find. I would go to the library and just ask the librarian for, for recommendations about gold or silver uh, hunting. Um, I find the subject so interesting because each author treats it a little bit differently. You'll understand right away when you're looking at the book, whether it's a, an exploration book, as you were saying, or whether they're actually talking about the science of gold and, and how you prospect for it, which is also a very interesting subject matter. I would look at that myself. I'd look into the science of prospecting, which is really fascinating. You have to build all kinds of special things and it's all done still now today. I, I, I don't know if I made that clear to you. We're talking about old times here, but this is very much something that happens now. There's people in their RVs out in the middle of Mojave Desert in California, chipping away at the earth, just like they did back, the, you know, a hundred years before. People are always looking for stuff everywhere in the world. So these books are, are quite contemporary if you want them. Absolutely. And speaking of people currently seeking adventure and exploration, we had lots of adventure seekers who were wondering uh, how they get to be you, how they get to do <laughs> what you do. So any advice for students looking to take your path and, and explore an adventure? Here's my answer to that. Um, don't try to be me, but try to be better than me. Uh, if I was your age, again, I would be very focused and read a lot. I would want to read a lot and I would want to get very clear on what interested me in the world. Part of being, part of the challenge of being young is that you're looking up a mountain, you know, and I mean that metaphorically, it's a big mountain towards adulthood. 
And it just seems like the world is just too big for, for words. I remember that feeling. And I wish I'd been more uh, focused on what I cared about and how I could you know, find a passion that really mattered to me. And that's what I would suggest to you guys to, to figure out what in history interests you and really get fascinated by it. Read a lot about that subject and, and, and don't give up. Keep going on, on. Think of it as a gold mine, if you will. You know, when you find gold, there's a seam of gold. Remember I told the, talked about this, the gold being carried forth by the magma or brought up by the magma. That creates a seam of gold. When you are interested in a subject matter, such as history or some part of history, you can get on that seam and keep digging and keep moving down that gold until you get everything that you need, all the wealth you were looking for, which is the knowledge you, you desire. That would be a way of, of arriving at, at a place where I just lucked into. You know, I was a, a lucky guy. I ended up uh, following my nose into a, into a career that, that panned out okay for me. Um, but you can be a lot more deliberative about it, deliberate about it, and go to school and, and study history, study archaeology, study these things that, that uh, again, seem like too big for words. But the truth is, you do internships, you start, you know, talking to people and learning uh, how to do these things. And, you know, when I was young, I wanted nothing more than to scuba dive in the Mediterranean and find Roman ships. That was my big thing. I wanted to find M4I down there. Well, last year, uh, I was in the Mediterranean. I was doing a show in Croatia. And what did I do? I scuba dived to find M4I. They are still finding them. They are still doing archaeology like this. It's a very present thing. And my big message to kids when I go out and talk in schools and so forth is that the world has not left you behind. It is right there waiting for you to crack it open. There's stuff to learn. There's discoveries to be made. There's books to be written. And you're the guys who are going to do it because you're the one that are interested in history. And that's really exciting to me. That is so wonderful. And I know we have stolen a little bit more of your time than we promised. So we'll sure. leave things with just one more question. We have lots of students who are wondering, uh, were there treasure hunts in their state or treasure hunts in this particular continent or this particular region? So perhaps to uh, make a very specific question general, uh, we spoke a little bit about being able to explore and perhaps explore the internet to learn more about treasure hunts nearby. But mm. uh, were there any unusual or unexpected treasure hunts or maybe fa favorite treasure hunts we didn't get the chance to talk about today that students should explore on their own time. Look at the Alabama treasure hunt. Just, just Google that in gold in, in Alabama. Uh, there was a whole story I did on Mysteries at the Museum about that. And I can't remember the details of it, quite honestly. It was a long time ago. But I remember it being an unusual story for me because I didn't know that gold was in Alabama. And then when we did the story, it was about a community that grew up as a result of it. So very much keeping in the theme of the evening that more happens, you know, than meets the eye. It's not just about gold. It's about the uh, a cultural phenomenon that happened. Um, I just learned tonight or when I was reading through these things for, for this, this uh, talk that gold was found in Tennessee in 1821, I think it was. Uh, that fascinated me. I didn't even know there were volcanoes in, in Tennessee, uh, but there's mountains there. So I guess that's why. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just a, it's an endless story that uh, really you, you, your next trip to Florida, if you go down there for any reason, ask to go to the archaeological museum in Florida. I think it's around Vero Beach or something like that. The, uh, the Spanish stories of finding gold are just so romantic and so exciting to me and, and appeal to me as a scuba diver. So one day soon, maybe I'll find a gold bar down there. I don't know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for today's adventure and for kickstarting the adventure for those of us who are tuning in. Uh, thank you for those of you tuning in for all of your thoughtful questions. And we hope to see you all back in another Varsity Tutor Star course soon. But in the meantime, don't forget to post those selfies and tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as Don Wildman. Thanks so much, Don. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.